Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you doing? I hope you're well. I'm doing pretty darn, darn nifty. We are going to be covering day three in the Rosenbaum trial in this video. And I, you know, I've got some stuff to say about this one. I mean, and yeah, if y'all watch day three, you know you've got some stuff to say about it too. Uh, a lot went on in this, and so I'm going to try and make it a brief video for you uh, and just go over some major themes that I saw take place. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and review. Okay, so again, day three starts off with Millie's adoptive mother, Amanda Har Harrell. Harrell. I like this lady because you could tell she was very passionate about having Millie as a daughter, about adoption, things of this nature. She was very concerned. You know, never wanted to be extra careful in regards to having a child that had trauma in the past, things of this nature. And I really respected that about her. Uh, and so some of the, the big things that t stuck out to me was the things that Millie told her about incidents at the Rosenbaums, uh, which were things such as I get spanked. If I, we, a rule was they would get spanked if they fell asleep in the car. Uh, also, the, something about she wasn't doing something fast enough, which I think later we find out it was like getting dressed. And so Jennifer, she said that Jennifer twisted her ankle and sat down on her. Uh, another thing was that she made her eat mashed potatoes until she threw up and then made her eat the throw up. I mean, literally just stuff like when you're hearing these things come out, your heart breaks. You're like, can you imagine hearing a child, anybody for that matter, but a child nonetheless telling you these things? I mean, you're just like, what am I, I mean, why do I do this? Why do I watch this? But, you know, it's just, it is what it is. So the defense gets up there. And now, mind you, this lady has been sitting in the audience watching, so she knows what this defense is about. And the defense gets up there, and she basically tries to establish that Millie is a liar. And, you know, the defense doesn't want any substance to the answers is a huge thing that I found. If you notice, the defense is constantly like, so that's a yes. That's a no. You know, she doesn't want you to give any context. Or she says, say yes or no, and then and then add something to it. But she kind of will, like, cut them off or put words in their mouth. Or isn't it true that, if you notice, a lot of the stuff that she says, isn't it true that, you know, or so that's a yes. People are like, no, it's not. You know, <laughs> no. And when they add a little bit of context to it, it's like, oh, no. You're trying to make it out like, you know, for example, the Millie being a liar thing, you know, is Millie lie? Is Millie a liar? Yes or no? Well, technically, yes, she lied. But thank you. Okay, now, and it's like no. When somebody's lying about something just to play with a toy extra long, you see where I'm going with that? And so I just felt like, you know, come on, you know, really, like, why are you running these people through the mill like they are on trial for something? So now another huge part of this day was Millie getting up to speak. And I mean, this was honestly, I was just like, did we have, I mean, really? Do we have to bring this poor little girl into this? I mean, it's bad enough that this child's been through all this. And so they bring her up there. And again, I didn't feel like Millie's testimony, maybe on an emotional level, brought stuff up. But it wasn't like, you know, I was just like, do we really need to put this little girl through this? So, you know, she, you know, talks about how she felt sad when she thinks of the house. You know, talks about some of the rules they couldn't fall asleep in the car. Things of that nature, you know. Just things that you're just like, because just that alone, we're not allowed to fall asleep in the car. We get spanked. And talking about that, like, you know, oh, we get spanked in the bedroom and Joseph didn't do anything and this and that. And I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, what is these children doing in Jennifer's world that's so awful that they need to get spanked like this? I mean, my God, and falling asleep in a car. I mean, I, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around why would that even be a thing? Is it because she wants them to sleep when they get home? I mean, I'm just like, why would you even make that rule up? Do you, I mean, how often do children fall asleep in the car? Now, the defense gets up there and questions Millie. And I mean, even like I think that you can see in the child's demeanor, it changes a little bit with her. You know, she's, again, the defense is trying to like just grab at straws like to, you know, did you jump in the bed? Oh, did you brush up against this? And, you know, she's trying to show all these things where I'm just like, really? You're trying to establish that? Like, don't, it's not even worth trying. Because when you sit here and you go back over the, the coroner's report and things like this, it's like, absolutely not. You know, absolutely not. Even if a child was a liar, which again, all kids lie to a certain degree. I mean, this is just part of, it's a lesson you learn. 
I'm more concerned about the grown adult this line than I am, you know, a, a, a five year old or something. But the things that she's even trying to come up with about that, I'm like, this is, you know, this is almost irrelevant. You know, she's trying to make it out like this child had some grand scheme of something. And I'm just not seeing that. I mean, it is what it is. Now, another huge part of the testimony is coming from foster parents, people in the system. And basically what all of this testimony is doing is establishing what is protocol for if a kid gets hurt, things of this nature. And at what point did you have the girls? Did they have bruises? Did they not? Yada, yada, yada. And so you can see through the timeline of these girls and where they travel that essentially these children don't have any kind of marks on them or anything drastic until Jennifer and Joseph come into their life. And all the testimony adds up. When you start piecing together different stories, and that's where, again, like the whole thing about Millie being a liar and all this, and I'm just like, no, you can sit here and listen to the testimony and everyone's stories. This piece of the puzzle matches this piece of the puzzle and this piece of the puzzle matches this piece of the puzzle. And even with Millie's mother describing how she divulged some of her trauma of what took place in the house, you know, where they would be doing something and out of the blue, she would spit something out. I mean, a lot of times that's how children can be with things like that, where something will come out and you never know. I mean, sometimes kids can say stuff. Maybe they saw something on TV, this, that, the other, who knows? But in this scenario, when those things all match and you start connecting the dots, unfortunately, after the fact, uh, but you start connecting the dots and you see, no, this isn't something this kid's making up. Like, this has some substance to it. One of the groundbreaking testimonies in this day was, and I'm going to ruin her name, but she was the lady who worked for, you know, DFAX, or she was the person who applications went through. She ran the impact program, uh, things of this nature. Ch I'm going to probably butcher this, but I'll try. Uh, Shanice Odiku. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm probably saying that completely wrong. I loved this one. <laughs> I absolutely loved her. When a sane voice, and I mean, I, I'm not trying to say other people in this aren't sane, but she just kind of had this attitude, like this no-nonsense attitude of this is this. And when you started hearing her testimony coming out, you got a much clearer picture. Because one thing I think we're all asking is, how do these children end up with this woman? You know, like, my God, what's going on? And you start seeing, oh my gosh, this is what took place. You know, um, so I'm just going to go through, through some of the things of her testimony that really stuck out to me. So she is in charge of doing the background checks for these people. And basically, in essence, what she's saying is she had two background checks. One came through, one was like in Jennifer's maiden name, and one was her and her husband as a couple. And she basically is saying that the, the, they've started to go through, but they fizzled out, was her words. And nothing really came of them. And one of them, she said, Jennifer's came back with all the CPS stuff on it. And that's when it was like, oh, okay, she was in the foster care system herself, and this triggered an investigation. And so, now, in one part, I felt like she said she didn't get approved for the first one, and then she came back with, oh, here, me and my husband are, or whatever. So, that part I was a little murky on. I got confused, and even the defense was like, okay, I'm confused about something, and at that point, I was like, I am too. You know, so I'm glad she's asking, but I still kind of left that part. So, I felt like she was essentially saying, no, these kind of fizzled out a little bit. But... Essentially, what she's saying is that the applications come through her, the home studies, all this type of stuff, if that's going on, she knows it's taking place, and she never knew this was taking place with Jennifer and Joseph. Now, part of the stuff that gets you to the point of the gall is Jennifer called this woman up with a total attitude, and I'm sure she was nasty, and as she said, she wasn't nice, or she was mean. Basically saying, why is this taking so long? And essentially throwing her title around. I know all these people, and you know, who do you think you are? And da 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 and so on and so forth. So this woman is now saying that Jennifer never attended the impact class, and there was never a home study done. And so essentially, the defense is also like, the defense is the entire time at time is trying to say, but if there was one done, then you didn't you you don't know about it. And she's like, there wasn't one done. But you you didn't know about it. There wasn't one done. And essentially, what the the lady, the worker, is trying to say is, no, it's basically my this is my interpretation, in my words. If there was one done, it was shady and it didn't count because that wasn't supposed to happen. You know, it went around me, and so therefore there wasn't one done on my end. And I believed her, because just hearing Jennifer, I was like, oh, she pulled some strings. She had something done, and I think I saw somewhere that it was like someone wrote a letter of recommendation from her office, and so 
I'm sure, you know, oh, so-and-so says this is okay in this, and things get melded around. That's how I left it. You know, please tell me in the comment section what you think. So that part with her testimony was eye-opening and eye-shattering. First of all, it showed me just the level of entitlement that Jennifer has. So, you know, whatever reason she's not getting approved to do this stuff, she doesn't go through impact training. She doesn't go through the other thing. And another person said that they thought it was weird when they heard the testimony or whatever. And it might have been this lady, I just don't remember right now. And I don't have it in my notes. I'm just remembering this aspect where she said, you know, they're CPR trained. And so it's odd that she said she didn't know how to do CPR on the phone call or whatever, because that's training you go through. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, so then we have another foster parent, uh, Patricia Lambert, I believe is how you say her name. She gets up there. She had the girls. And this is even more eye-opening testimony. I mean, these women here did, I mean, I, when I say they did damage, I mean in a good way. Because to me, I was like, these people are very believable. And they're not painting a pretty picture of Jennifer and Joseph, the system, or anything at all. So right off the bat, a major thing that stood out to me in this situation is, number one, she says she doesn't think think Samantha White, the caseworker, is doing her job when checking for bruises. Samantha's White's name comes up, and then I believe she's been fired at this point. Thank God. Her name is all mixed in with all this stuff, and I'm just like, oh. And, and again, this is what I'm going to be doing. Uh, so let's take a little, you know, a side street here for a second. I'm going to be doing like a podcast, some talks on my and Matt's experience with adoption, the foster care system, uh, working with these case workers, all that type stuff, because we see this in time and time again in these cases. And I would like to share my experience when I saw it because it keeps coming up. And some of it, I'm like, yep, I recognize this. I recognize this. I mean, I didn't get, do anything to deal with children getting abused or murdered or anything like that, but I just saw firsthand how I'm like, oh, I see how this stuff can happen. So anyways, I'm going to be doing some talks on that and I'll let y'all know when that comes out or whatever. Um, so back to our regularly scheduled program. So Samantha's white name is on all this. And basically she was like, I don't feel like she's doing her job well in regards to checking the children for bruises. And I guess she just really wasn't doing it that well. So this Patricia lady, I mean, she was just, again, one of these people where you're like, praise God for this woman. You know, she is just so smart. She cared about these kids. And she really looked out for him and dotted her I's and crossed her T's. So now she says she got the kids on the 12th. I don't have the month written down in front of me. But basically the next day, they did a home visit with Jennifer. And essentially that same day, Jennifer calls and said that the child is sick. She can't deal with it. Patricia needs to come get the kids. And, I mean, that's so telling. Like, really? When the going gets tough, right off the bat, you're like, come get them. I can't handle this. And so she took them to the hospital because, again, Patricia, and this is kind of my experience, too, in this, where it's like you don't really know what's going on with the kid. And so you have to be extra out there because, again, like, there's just a sense of anything. If this kid blinks wrong, you need to notify 10 different people type thing. And Patricia really stuck to that. So she took the kids to the hospital. Basically, one of them had a cold. You know, they gave her some medicine to uh, help prevent throwing up. And even the case where Patricia said, the pill was so big, I was afraid to give it to such a small child. So she got something like Pepto-Bismol or whatever, because she was afraid the child would choke. I mean, I was just like, thank you. So as this is going on, so as Patricia has these kids, Jennifer's taken for weekends. And in the beginning, the banks were taking them some, but mostly it was Jennifer and them. And now Patricia documented stuff like visits and things like this. She was very meticulous. So at one point they go over to the house. Layla comes back with a little scar under her eye. And Jennifer says, oh, you know what? Uh, the kids were playing. It was something. It, it was probably understandable because it's the first time that it happened. But, you know, she was like, okay. Hey, you know, here's this, this happened, da, 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 da. So two weeks later, they visited again. I believe it was two weeks or the third week or they, the kids visited again and they came back with like red, fresh bruises on their backs and butts and legs and stuff like that. So then Ms. You know, Patricia confronts Jennifer about this and Jennifer makes some comment about defects better not have, you know, report on this and da, 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 da. And I'm just like, what? I mean, why would you even say that? I mean, how, and I mean, like at that point, if you're abusing these kids like that, and maybe in her world it's not abuse, I don't know. So at this point, Patricia takes the children to DFAC's office, where she tries to call the caseworker, Samantha White can't get her, tries to get her supervisor, can't get her. So she drives the children there, and it's like, look at this, this is not right. This needs to be investigated. You know, so pictures were taken, she wanted the situation investigated. Then there was more bruises that came back, 
and basically Patricia went, she was like, this, this has to stop. No. And so essentially what happened is the kids were then removed from her home. So it's just heartbreaking. Whatever's going on with us is just like, oh my gosh. And then she even says like a few weeks, a few weeks later, she had Millie at her house and Millie was saying that, you know, she was beat by Joseph and Jennifer and Layla was dragging down the stairs and things like this. And so again, and I'm going to kind of round this out because the video is becoming a little long, uh, you see again in this testimony where the kids are saying this stuff and you start to piece together where they're over here and nothing happened and they're over here and nothing happened. Well, now we're getting eyewitness testimony of the children are going to her home and they are coming back bruised and damaged. I am telling her caseworker and defects in these places and documenting it and they're essentially getting rid of me. So this is where it's just like, what? And more than that, what I think is going on also is she's pulling strings. Jennifer's pulling strings. I personally feel like she is trying to get the children as like, you know, a designer handbag thing. She was one in the seat. She was political. This would look very good to have a couple of kids. Maybe she couldn't adopt kids or maybe she couldn't have kids. I'm not sure. I don't know what her motives, you know, why the motives were there. But I just feel like that could be part of the process because I'm just not, again, I never understand when people have to resort to beating children. I don't get that. I don't understand it. I don't condone it. And especially, obviously, when it's a brutal beating like this, I mean, she murdered this child. And I know that I'm saying she did this, she did that. But at this point in this case, the evidence is so glaring to me. And seeing her demeanor and entitlement also being funneled through her attorney, who is just horrid. I mean, my gosh. You know, talk about a nasty attitude. You know, and it's just a shame. And I could understand the t the defense attorney's outrage if there was like a, look, this person's being railroaded, then maybe that attitude would be good. But this is the wrong arena for it. This is not the right arena for that attitude. So, anyways, I'm, I'm putting the soapbox over here. <laughs> I'm sorry I kept going on. Uh, this case has just really gotten under my skin. So, I hope y'all are doing well. I hope you have a good weekend, week, whatever this, wherever this video finds you. Uh, down in the description, there's all these places you can follow me at and chat with me at and do all that fun stuff check out the new podcast there's links to friends podcast uh so be sure and check all that out thank you for choosing time thank you thank you for shopping with us have a nice day thank you for choosing to spend time with me i very much appreciate it and i, I can't sing like whitney but i'll talk to you soon